Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new Revive webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARDP. My name is Astrid Pence-Moore, and I'm hosting today's session, Mining Chemical Libraries for New Antibacterials. Revive is GARDP's education and outreach program, and it aims to connect and support the antimicrobial R&D community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge, and connecting people. This, this webinar series is part of our educational activities. All, all webinars are recorded in full and can be viewed after the live broadcast on our website revive.gardp.org slash webinars. As usual, today's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar via the questions window in uh, your webinar control panel as shown on the slide. We will address the questions after our presentation and will do our best to respond to as many as possible. Today's speaker is Karl Balibar and our moderator is Benjamin Blasco, Senior Discovery Project Manager here at GARDP. And with this, I'm handing over to you, Ben. Thank you, Astrid. So I'm happy to welcome today's speaker, Carl Balibar. Carl is a principal scientist in the Department of Infectious Diseases at Merck's Research Laboratories in West Point, Pennsylvania. He received his PhD in Biological Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology from Harvard University, where he worked on natural products in the lab of Christopher Walsh. He then joined the Infectious Diseases Department at the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research in 2007 to interrogate the physiology of various bacterial pathogens and to discover novel antibacterial compound target pairs. Carl joined Merck in 2012 and is, is currently responsible for early discovery, target validation and lead identification activities. And today he will be sharing with us his expert opinion and experience on antibacterial drug discovery. So welcome Carl, you can start your presentation now. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, today I'll be talking to you about uh, mining chemical libraries for new antibacterials. At the start of the genomics era in the early 2000s, many thought that it'd be easy to find the next generation of antibiotics. It would simply be a matter of sequencing the offending organisms, using genetics to establish which genes are essential, and picking any number of your favorite tar uh, targets and designing potent inhibitors. However, those efforts uh, widely ended in, in failure. And to this day, there is yet to be a novel class of antibiotic approved that was developed through rationally chosen target-based approaches uh, from the start of the genomics era. The reason for this is that in vitro biochemical potency rarely translates into cellular activity, especially for gram-negative bacteria. The permeability barrier established by the opposing physical chemical properties of the inner and the outer membrane and the arsenal of efflux pumps that can remove a vast array of chemotypes do not get into uh, uh, that do not that do get into the cells results in the fact that the IC50 against your target of interest rarely translates into a minimal inhibitory concentration or an MIC. So phenotypic screening, that is to say, screening for a particular cellular activity, has historically been and remains to this day the most successful strategy for identifying new antibacterial compounds. The issue with issues with this approach is that it can be challenging to find the target because you, you don't have a target in mind beforehand. Uh, compounds that you uh, identify could simply be nonspecific cytotoxins, or you could end up rediscovering uh, existing compounds or compounds with the same mechanism of action as an existing antibiotic. Therefore, going forward in mining large chemical libraries for novel antibacterials, it's probably more prudent to combine the old with the new and use a combination of genomics error approaches and traditional phenotypic screening to enable hit prioritization and target identification. The key is to know what you, uh, what you could refer to here as your ABCs. So you need to know your assay, you need to know your biology, and you need to know your chemical matter. And I'll get into that a little more uh, as we go through the presentation. So here I wanna take a look at what a typical screening campaign might look like and how many hits you can expect to get. 
On the left is a screening campaign conducted at Merck in 2012, in which 3 million compounds were screened against the model gram-negative organism, E. coli. In, uh, in order to increase the hit rate, a toll C efflux deficient strain was used. Uh, and uh, and even with this general, and even using this strain and with a generous cutoff of 50% inhibition of bacterial growth, only 36,000 primary hits came out of the screen. So from 3 million compounds, we only found 36,000 primary hits. In follow-up assays, testing against some more relevant organisms such as the escape pathogens, so Klebsiella, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, um, and Staph aureus, um, uh, you uh, you only end up with several hundred hits that are active against those relevant pathogens. And furthermore, many of those hits are overtly cytotoxic and not bacterial specific as assessed by activity in yeast. So out of the 36,000 primary hits, about 23,000 were active on yeast, and that's a predictor for nonspecific cytotoxicity, which, as I told you on the previous slide, uh, is one of the issues with running a phenotypic screen is that you could end up with some nonspecific cytotoxins. While the screen on the left was designed to find broad hits on a model organism that you would translate to other relevant pathogens, another approach is to screen against the organism you care most about. So on the right is a screen that we ran in 2015 looking for compounds with antibacterial against the WHO's number one priority pathogen, Acinetobacter belmonii. I won't run through all the triage, but in the end, after screening 2.6 million compounds, there were only 101 compounds that demonstrated reasonable wild-type activity against the organism. So what these two screen campaigns should demonstrate to you is that there's a limited new, there's limited new chemical matter that will have the desired potent antibacterial activity that you would want straight out of a screen of a chemical library. The hit rate, as you can see, was 0.004% for wild-type active molecules. If you find some from the screen, fantastic. Those should be the first compounds that you follow up on. And because there are going to be so few, you should be able to pursue them all. But more likely, you're going to have to work for the prize for that new antibiotic. The best approach might be to cast a somewhat broader net and start with compounds that have activity against sensitized gram negatives and conduct medicinal chemistry campaigns to optimize their activity. The issue is that even though they are still relatively low in abundance compared to the, the large library that you're screening, uh, there's still too many to follow up on them all. So there needs to be a way to prioritize. The first inclination might be to triage based on physical chemical properties. But the truth is we don't still we still don't fully understand the combination of properties that enhance permeability and evade efflux. Instead, what we at Merck do is follow the biological readout. So all bioactive compounds from all the various screens that we've run, and I showed you two on the previous slide, uh, get added to a sub-library of antibacterial bioactives. And those get followed up more uh, in depth in target-based approaches, and I'll get into that shortly. So I wanted to show you why prioritizing based on physical chemical properties can be a bit misguided. So here is a snapshot of various properties of the bioactive set of compounds that we've identified from our large library. There's about 140,000 molecules represented here, and they span a wide range of property space along parameters such as C log D, total, surface po to total polar surface area, molecular weight, rotatable bonds, and positive charge. It's hard to exclude compounds when activity doesn't necessarily track with higher or lower values across these parameters. So there's not a clear pattern that emerges where all the bioactive molecules, say, fall into a particular molecular weight range. It, it, it spans a, a wide range. And I want to give you as an example on the second half of the slide here, uh, a few parameters for a compound that we identified from a screen against a particular target. Now, although I can't disclose the target organism, I can say that the MICs listed here are against the wild type clinically relevant escape gram negative pathogen. So what you see here are the compounds that were synthesized during the medicinal chemistry campaign in order that they were made. So from, comp from the original hit from the screen 
um, down the line to uh, an example, a 14th example of a compound that was made, and that 14th example is later on in the campaign than the first example that would be number one. So the original hit was fairly small, had somewhat high C log D, but lacked cellular wild type activity. So it was 380 molecular weight, 4.4 in log D, but it had no wild type cellular activity. We picked this up by screening a sensitized strain. Uh, various publications which claim to define the property space a molecule must occupy to attain wild type gram negative activity would recommend that you keep that molecule small, so under a molecular weight of 500, decrease the C log D to under two, and increase the primary uh, amines. But one of the first wild type active compounds that we obtained in the campaign did the opposite of all that. The molecular weight, we actually almost doubled it. The C log D increased by three orders of magnitude. And an amine, as judged here by the second compound, uh, didn't really have an effect on, on the MIC. In fact, the, the MIC went up. It, it, it was better without that primary amine. And in fact, we had molecules where we could attain wild type activity with no amines and even a free acid. So compound nine here has no free amines and it was actually negatively charged. And we still had just as good uh, wild type activity as with this molecule, which had the primary amine. Ultimately, for other reasons, uh, including uh, optimizing in vivo PK and solubility, we did try to lower the C log D. So as you see, as we progressed through the program, the C log D went from 7.6 down to 0 0.9. Um, and uh, we did lower the molecular weight. So we backed off from this 630 or even this 900 molecule went down to 470. But that wasn't because the molecule didn't have antibacterial activity. All of these molecules had antibacterial activity on wild type clinically relevant escape pathogen gram negatives. Um, so this just brings home the point that we don't really understand the gram negative activity property space. So it's not prudent to triage your hit list based on physical chemical properties because we don't understand what gives the best gram negative activity. Now returning to that bioactive set that I spoke about before, there are two main strategies that we employ to interrogate those compounds. We can use a target-centric approach where we screen against one particular uh, target of interest, either in a cellular context so for instance, here with uh, a transgenic overexpressor or with antibiotic synergy against the cells, or in vitro as an isolated protein, such as in a biochemical or biophysical assay, um, such as uh, uh, an enzyme assay or um, an ALICE assay, and I'll get into what ALICE is in a little while. Uh, alternatively, we can screen a bit broader, uh, looking at entire pathways of interest, we can make, which can make use of various phenotypic cellular assays listed here. And then the next uh, few slides, I'm going to run through various examples in which we use these approaches to identify novel compound target pairs for hits that came from our bioactive set, from that set of 140,000 I spoke to you about. And just briefly, uh, I'm, we're going to look at five different uh, compound target pairs. Two of them came from target-centric approaches using biophysical assays, and three actually came from pathway-based approaches uh, using various uh, phenotypic and chemical genetic uh, lethality screens. So the first compound that I want to talk about is MRL770. This was a compound that came out of that 2012 screen that I showed you, which was against the sensitized E. coli strain. We were completely target agnostic. All we knew is that it had um, uh, antibacterial activity. And so we put this molecule along with many others through a target agnostic pathway-based assay called MML or macromolecular labeling. And so what this, path, what this assay looks at is inhibition of radio labeled precursors um, uh, in the cell. So you feed the cell radio labeled precursors of DNA, RNA, protein, phospholipids, peptidoglycan, or lipopolysaccharide. If your compound inhibits their incorporation, that means your compound could be inhibiting a target involved in the biosynthesis of, of, of the substrates for these pathways. And so what we found is for MRL770, there was a very robust and very specific inhibition of the incorporation of DNA radio labeled precursors. And this sort of inhibition is very similar to what you would find 
for the uh, class of antibiotics known as the fluoroquinolones. And here I have an example, um, ciprofloxacin, which is one of the fluoroquinolones. Um, and these compounds inhibit DNA gyrase. As I said, we found these compounds because they were active in a sensitized strain of E. coli. And so what we have here is the activity of MRL-770 and two other analogs that were available from our library against the Tulsi E. coli. So you see they have cellular activity, but it's a sensitized strain. As soon as you use a wild type E. coli, they lose their activity. So the MICs uh, are larger than can be measured. Um, the same holds true for other organisms, other gram-negative organisms. And so the compound does have broad spectrum activity against gram-negative, so it's active against an acinetobacter and a pseudomonas. But again, they have to be sensitized strains. So for the pseudomonas, it has to be efflux deficient. And for acinetobacter, we actually have an LPXC deleted version in which the outer membrane is severely compromised. The compound did not actually have um, Staph aureus um, activity, and that will become clear uh, as, to, as to why later. So because the compound um, was very specific in inhibiting DNA, radio-labeled DNA precursor incorporation, and it was so similar to what we see for a fluoroquinolone, we thought perhaps the target might be the same as the fluoroquinolones. It might be DNA gyrase or um, topoisomerase. It's a it's a dual targeting inhibitor. And uh, because gyrase is such a proof, it's uh, validated, there is a, you know, there's an entire class of antibiotics that are active against this target. Um, we have the gyrase assays up and running um, just on a regular basis. And so we decided to throw these compounds, um, 770, um, along with analogs 4 through 3 and 1082, into this assay. And what we saw is that similar to ciprofloxacin, which inhibits the supercoiling that gyrase does, we did see dose-dependent inhibition of supercoiling by this class of compounds as well. And that held when we looked at E. coli gyrase or Pseudomonas aeruginosa gyrase. Furthermore, the compounds seem to uh, inhibit gyrase in a similar mechanism to the fluoroquinolones. So fluoroquinolones uh, inhibit gyrase at a particular step that leads to a double strand breakage in the DNA, which in the assay you can visualize as a linear uh, segment of DNA that, that um, occurs upon compound treatment. And so you see that linear segment right here with the ciprofloxacin. And then the same thing with MRL-423, which is, again, an example of, of the um, 770 class. The, um, another DNA gyrase inhibitor, novobiosin, does not lead to this type of um, double-strand breakage and linear fragment formation. So we knew that the mechanism of inhibition of gyrase was more similar to the fluoroquinolones than it was to uh, novobiosin, which is um, an ATP uh, site inhibitor. So ultimately, in order to um, identify the target, the gold standard is to select for a resistant mutant. And if you're lucky, the mutations will map to your target of interest. Those mutations normally will uh, lead to steric clashes in the binding site. And so your compound no longer binds and the, uh, the bacteria becomes resistant uh, to the compound of interest. And so we did that and we selected for several mutations. Um, they're listed here, they're just numbered in order from one to, to eight, and all of them had mutations in DNA gyrase. And then um, what was interesting is that those mutations that conferred resistance to the MRL770 class were, did not confer resistance to the fluoroquinolone ciprofloxacin. And so what that was telling us is that although the mechanism of inhibition led to that double-stranded break similar to a fluoroquinolone, it was different, uh, it was a different binding site than the fluoroquinolones, which is always great because you want to try to find new mechanisms of inhibition even if the target is the same and the ultimate result of that inhibition is uh, is the same as an existing class, but you want it to bind in a different place so that you don't have cross resistance to existing classes of antibiotics. And then here on a crystal structure, I simply um, have mapped out the um, 
these uh, resistance mutation sites, and you can see that they're clustering away from what is known to be the fluoroquinolone binding site over here. So they're not close enough, and which means our target, um, our binding site is is somewhere else, um, probably near these um, resistant mutation sites. What's interesting is all these mutations map to um, a particular domain in the E. coli gyrase that is not present in the gram-positive gyrase, it's in the toprim domain, um, and that's probably why we don't have activity against Staph aureus, because Staph aureus lacks the domain in which we were able to select mutants to this compound in E. coli. So that was an example of taking a completely target agnostic approach, looking at phenotypic data, putting it through an unbiased pathway assay, and coming up with uh, an inhibitor against uh, gyrase, which, uh, which is great. But sometimes you have a target in mind uh, before you even start the screen. And so this is an example where we took a pathway-based assay, assay, but we tailored it to be looking at one particular pathway. And in this case, it's the riboflavin pathway. So riboflavin um, is a, a precursor to FMN and FAD, which are cofactors in many, many uh, enzymes involved in primary biosynthesis in, in bacteria. And so the first thing that we wanted to do when looking at this pathway is to ensure that, that inhibiting it would actually lead to cell death or avirulence in, this, in the uh, organism that we care about. So we started with E. coli. What we did is we made um, conditional knockouts in Rib A and Rib B, which are two enzymes within the riboflavin pathway. And we're able to keep these knockouts alive by feeding in high concentrations of riboflavin. And so we made the knockouts. They are oxytrophic for riboflavin, meaning they can't survive unless you feed them the riboflavin. And then what we did is we grew them up, washed out the riboflavin. So we have cells um, that were alive, but now do not, are, now do not have um, the nutrient they need to sustain. And we infected a mouse. And what you can see here, is that whereas the wild type strain um, at a particular infectious burden leads to um, high virulence and death of um, three of the five mice that we infected, infection with these mutants at higher inocula leads to significantly reduced burden in the mouse and also all of the mice are able to survive that infection. So this showed us that riboflavin is a viable pathway for inhibition to give antibacterial activity, or at least um, uh, would be antivirulent uh, in vivo. So we designed a phenotypic screen looking for molecules whose bioactivity would be suppressed in the presence of riboflavin. What you're seeing here is an agar plate in which there are bacteria embedded in the agar. And normally what that would do after growing overnight is you get a lawn of bacteria and the plate looks opaque. It looks kind of cloudy. And then you spot your compound on top and um, if the compound has bioactivity and is an inhibitor to growth, you end up with a zone of clearing. So here you have spots of compound in reduced uh, concentrations and from the center of the spot, the compound diffuses out and gives you a nice circle of inhibition of growth, a zone of inhibition. And these circles get smaller with the lower concentration of compound that you're spotting because less compound gives you less inhibition. And what we did is we screened the bioactive set for molecules that would inhibit the zone of inhibition. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, that uh, we screened the bioactive set for compounds that gave the zone of inhibition, but then were reversed uh, upon treatment with riboflavin. And so that's what you see here for this compound that we're terming ribosyl. So when this molecule was plated in the presence of riboflavin, its bioactivity, its zone of inhibition disappears. We decided to then look at riboflavin levels in the cell to confirm that the treatment with this molecule was actually uh, decreasing the amount of riboflavin that was synthesized, and that was the case. So here we see the treatment with ribosyl with this compound leads to a dose-dependent reduction in cellular riboflavin levels. And as I said before, the gold standard is to select for resistant mutants. And so we did that. 
we got some mutants that were resistant to the compound, and we sent them out for whole genome sequencing. But prior uh, to getting the results of that, we decided to go ahead and sequence individually all of the riboflavin pathway enzymes. So riboflavin A, B, D, E, F, um, because we thought that we were going to be inhibiting one of these enzymes and the mutation should map to one of those enzymes. All of the enzymes in the pathway actually came back clean. They had no mutations in them, and that was a bit confounding at first. And then what happened is when we got the whole genome sequencing back, it turned out that the resistant mutations did not map to the actual enzymes, but rather to the FMN riboswitch, which is upstream of RIB-B and controls its transcription and translation. So what is a riboswitch? It's actually an aptamer ahead of an expression platform. And so under normal conditions, if you have a high amount of the metabolite that the pathway makes, it binds to the aptamer, it sequesters the ribosomal binding site in the start codon, and it turns off expression of the downstream gene. And this is a really great feedback loop for the cell to control the amount of um, metabolite that it's making. When there are very low amounts of the final product of this FMN, then the aptamer binds to the sequester loop, releases the ribosome binding site and the start codon, and you make more of the gene. So what our compound was doing is it was mimicking the final metabolite and pathway, the FMN, which binds to the riboswitch, and it was turning off expression of the downstream gene RIB-B. So all, as I said, all of our mutations actually map to the riboswitch. And so what it was doing is it was actually either destroying the function of the riboswitch, and so the, the gene was just constantly on, or it was preventing binding of our molecule to this aptamer within the riboswitch. Eventually, we were able to solve a co-crystal structure of ribosyl bound to the FMN riboswitch, and that's what you see here. And this just confirmed that this was actually our target of interest. Now, if you remember back on my very first slide is that I said that you need to know your ABCs. You need to know your assay, you need to know your biology, and you need to know your chemical matter. Well, this is a case in which knowing the biology was extremely important because had we decided to screen on Staph aureus as opposed to E. coli, we likely would not have found ribosol. And the reason for that is that Staph aureus actually has two FMN riboswitches. The first controls biosynthesis of riboflavin, very much similar to how it works in E. coli. But the second actually controls expression of a very high affinity uh, transporter, which takes up riboflavin from the environment. And so any inhibitor would have to actually inhibit both of these ribo, uh, ribo switches and very potently in order to see activity because that transporter is so efficient at taking up riboflavin from the environment. And so what I'm showing you here um, is the normal strain of E. coli that we did the original screen on, the zone of inhibition assays that I've described before, and this is in the normal cell culture media that we use CAMH. And so you see you have really robust inhibition of growth with ribosyl. The same is true under very slight amounts of riboflavin in the media. So if you add 0.2 micromolar of riboflavin, ribosyl, ribosyl still works in E. coli. However, if we actually express a gram-positive high-affinity riboflavin uh, transporter in this strain, ribosyl still works when when tested in CAMH media, but now because of the high efficiency of the transport of riboflavin um, in, the, in, in this overexpressing PNUX strain, we lose all activity of ribosome. And in Staph aureus, because it naturally has both of these, uh, it's taking up very, very small quantities of riboflavin and is able to suppress the bioactivity of ribosome. And even under CAMH conditions, um, you see only very modest inhibition, and we likely would have missed that had we been screening on Staph aureus. And so just to drive this point home, the MIC, the minimal inhibitory concentration of ribosil on E. coli in the, in the standard cell culture media that we used was two microgram per mil. 
it's higher, but it's still there for uh, MRSA cult, this cold strain of, of uh, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. However, if you had screened in any other media, in LB, in CAMHB with 12.5 nanomolar of riboflavin, or in media containing human serum, all of the activity goes away in staph, yet we still see it in E. coli. So it's very important to know your biology ahead of doing the screen so you can choose the right organisms and the right conditions in order to find the molecule, uh, the, the inhibitors that you want. So I'm gonna stay on this topic a little longer. So I just told you about how it was important to know your, your biology, and now here is a, a case where it's really important to know your assay. And so when we first found this inhibitor, it was really exciting because it was the first fully synthetic inhibitor of an RNA element with bioactivity. And so we thought, could we find more? And the assay that we decided to employ was something uh, that wasn't cellular, it was biophysical in nature, and it's called Automated Ligand Identification System, or ALICE, and it's a label-free, affinity-based mass spec platform that uses size exclusion chromatography to resolve target ligand complexes from unbound species. Then it dissociates the ligand from the complex using denaturing conditions and employs mass spec to identify the bound ligand. So you can incubate your target of interest. In this case, it would have been the RNA aptamer from the, from the riboswitch uh, with a compound library, uh, perform uh, um, LCMS in order to separate um, those compounds which bound from those that didn't, and then you dissociate the bound compounds and identify them based on their mass. And so what you're seeing here on the right is uh, displacement of these unnatural ligands, ribosyl, a variant of ribosyl that we have, roseoflavin, which is actually a natural inhibitor of the FMN riboswitch, um, and these bind to that RNA aptamer, and they're displaced in a dose-dependent manner by the natural ligand FMN. So this is just showing that that RNA aptamer is competent for binding FMN, and that it's actually um, uh, competing off inhibitors. So we ran the screen, and we did it with the wild-type FMN aptamer, a mutant version of the aptamer that was resistant to ribosyl. So we thought when we were running the screen, since we were getting these resistant mutations, wouldn't it be great to find something that was still effective against the ribosyl-resistant mutant? And also a scrambled FMN uh, riboswitch just to get rid of anything that was nonspecific. And so what we did is we decided to focus on these 20 WG compounds, which were active against the wild-type riboswitch and the mutant riboswitch, but not against the scrambled FMN. And what we found were two molecules shown here. And it was pretty obvious just based on this structure that these were nonspecific binders. This one is more or less an intercalator into nucleic acids, and this is a fluoroquinolone. And so although they do bind to the FMN riboswitch, although they can be competed with the natural ligand FMN, they do not have the same cellular activity that you would expect from a bona fide riboswitch inhibitor. So they're not the bioactivity is not suppressed by exogenous, exogenous riboflavin, which was the assay that we used in order to find ribosyl. Resistant selection did not yield mutations in the, in the RFN riboswitch. Instead, as we would have predicted, the WG3 molecule, which looks like a fluoroquinolone, those mutations map to JAR-A, to gyrase, which is the target of fluoroquinolones. And WG1 was found to act as a general DNA intercalating agent whose bioactivity was suppressed by just adding exogenous nonspecific DNA. So here was a case where using a different assay, you would have picked up molecules that you thought were riboswitch inhibitors, but in reality, they were just nonspecific nucleic acid binders. And we went so far as to even solve a crystal structure. So they are specifically binding to the riboswitch, but in a cellular context, this is not relevant. But before I tell you that biochemical, uh, in vitro biochemical activity 
can lead you down the wrong road, it can also work. So in this example, we actually identified a novel antibacterial RNA polymerase inhibitor using that ALICE platform. And so it was first identified by screening a compound library for binding against RNA polymerase in vitro in that ALICE platform. Um, it was then found to have the desired activity in an in vitro transcription assay. So it's a biochemical readout, not just biophysical. And finally, we returned to that MML assay, that macromolecular labeling assay, and it was found to specifically inhibit the incorporation of R radio labeled RNA precursors. So here we used ALICE and we're actually able to find a bona fide RNA polymerase inhibitor. And the final example I'm going to give is a pathway-based phenotypic screen looking for uh, an inhibitor of the sigma E response. And so we're really interested in the um, assembly of beta barrels on the outer membrane because in gram negatives, there are only two essential proteins on the outer membrane, um, which could be targets. And the reason that people like that is because um, they, uh, you wouldn't have to get a compound into the cell in order to be active the compound might be able to work from outside the cell, and that's a big hurdle that you don't have to overcome. And so any disruption of uh, inserting beta barrels into the outer membrane um, would induce the sigma E response. And so we have a specific strain of this uh, bacteria, which results in increased levels of sigma E, um, and elicits a more robust and rapid response to misassembled OMPs. And so RPOE allows the cell to survive under conditions in which um, the OMP assembly pathway is severely disrupted. So we ran a screen looking for things that um, inhibit bacterial growth and then block sigma E activation using this strain. And what one of the compounds that came out of that screen was betimostat. And so batimostat causes a concentration-dependent accumulation of unfolded OMPs, and you can see that here. And that accumulation of unfolded OMPs is dependent on inhibition of RSEP, which is a metalloprotease that's involved in the sigma E pathway, in induction of the sigma E pathway. And so what you see here is that with batimostat, your parent strain accumulates unfolded OMPs, but when you have a resistance mutation in RSEP, you no longer see that accumulation. And that holds true with these, inhib with these mutants in uh, the beta barrel assembly machinery, BAM-B and BAM-E, which also um, enhance the unfolded protein, um, unfolded accumulation of unfolded OMPs. And so again, in this BAM-B mutant, in uh, wild type background, you have unfolded OMPs produced, and then when you uh, put that in the background of an RCP mutant, betimostat no longer causes accumulation of those unfolded OMPs. So we use that mutation and we showed that it can confer resistance and prevent inhibition of the sigma E activity. So um, in addition to preventing that unfolded OMP response, we are able to um, inhibit the cleavage of an artificial substrate when fed to RCP, so this MBP RCA140. Um, you can see that under normal conditions, it's cleaved from full length to here, and that under increasing concentration of patimostat, that cleavage goes away. So we're inhibiting the cleavage of RCP. This is another piece of evidence that we are targeting RCP. And finally, uh, when we include the resistant mutation in the um, uh, the uh, reporter assay, um, it's able to alleviate the inhibition of that uh, uh, signal reduction. So I've told you about five programs here. Um, we had the gyrase inhibitor, which was identified by macromolecular labeling. This was an agnostic um, screen. It was not target-based. Um, we were able to confirm the activity in in vitro assays and the resistant mutations mapped to target. Uh, ribosil, batimostat, and the RNA polymerase inhibitor all mapped to their target and all 
um, and, and use various ways. Um, uh, we use various ways of, of identifying them. The uh, important thing to remember is that false positives can occur. They tend to occur more with biochemical assays than they do with cellular assays. And um, this is a great example because in vitro, yes, the compound bound to the riboswitch, there was even a co-crystal structure of the compound bound to the riboswitch. However, it did not inhibit um, in a pathway-specific phenotypic assay, and the resistant mutations did not map to the target. So in summary, as I said at the very beginning, it's really when you're going to mine chemical libraries for new antibiotics, you need to know your assay. So in vitro binding assays can yield hits with no or off-target cellular activity, and pathway-based cellular screens are more likely to be specific. You need to know your biology. The organism chosen for screening can have vast implications in the readout and in the end result, and certain pathways may not function the same in different organisms. And finally, know your chemical matter. So screening for wild-type gram-negative activity will yield very limited numbers of hits, and you won't have a lot of work to do. Um, but if you can define a bioactive set to mine through, you can streamline future screens, prioritize compounds, and have many more starting points. So I thank you for your attention, and I just want to acknowledge um, the numerous people that were involved in, in this work. And all of those examples um, have been published. And um, if you'd like to know a little bit more about them in depth, um, you can uh, look up the publications. So thank you, Carl, for an outstanding presentation. We will move now to the Q&A session. So as a quick reminder, please send your question via the questions window on your webinar control panel, and we will do our best to respond to as many questions as possible. Um, I already have a few questions from the audience. Um, two of them are kind of related. It's about physical chemical properties. Uh, so from the analysis of the Merck antibacterial bioactive set, um, I know you say you, you can't really find trends there, but um, are there, did you find any species, species specific trends um, or rules among the gram negatives? Are there common rules for gram negative bacteria or are they species specific? Okay. Um, so we haven't found any common rules. Um, they, I, I, yeah, I, I, I can't say more. I mean, we just, we, we've looked, we create models to try to, you know, mine through the data and try to pick up things that, you know, might make something more active. Um, we do research the literature and, and, you know, we try what people say, you know, small molecules, lower C log D, all these, all these things. But in the end, nothing really holds true across organisms or even within a single organism. So that uh, example I gave you, right, it, it, it was an organism where in other programs we've gone with um, smaller molecules, lower log D, and that seemed to work. But for this series of molecules, um, increasing the molecular weight was fine, had no, no issues. Um, and increasing the C log D was actually preferable. Like it, that was, that, those were our most active compounds. Thanks. Yeah. So related to that, um, again, about physical chemical properties, um, do you think it depends heavily on the target site on the bacteria? If it's a cytoplasmic target or cell wall target? So what I'll say is that compound that I uh, talked about, that was a cytoplasmic target. So I, I can't even say that it's because it was, you know, on the cell surface or in the periplasm. It, that compound had to get all the way through the entire cell to the cytoplasm. Um, I do think it's probably, um, if you have something on the outside of the cell, then there's no rules that apply, right? The molecule doesn't have to get in. If you're inhibiting, you know, the couple of essential proteins on the cell surface, then any molecule should do. And it's mostly about PK and safety at that point for development. Um, as my guess is that as you go, you know, deeper into the cell, the, the property space becomes more limiting. But I don't know that there is a single property space in which all molecules have to have to fall or whether there are, you know, galaxies of property space 
with a lot of black in between, right? A lot of null space in between. But you know, if you're in a certain galaxy, then then you're fine. But then you have to like make a quantum leap to a different galaxy in order to be in a different property space that the cell will permit. And like I said, a, um, a lot of the reasons that people go into a particular property space that <coughs> that the uh, people have published on is not necessarily because of the wild type gram negative activity. It might be because of um, development issues down the road. So you need better solubility, you need better PK, uh, you need to be, avoid off target activities in the host. And so that might be more the reason why people go to lower C log D um, and smaller molecules. Okay, so so again, related to that, um, someone is asking if um, any of your finding uh, has helped you guiding the synthesis of new compounds to build new libraries for the, for your screens, um, or is the diversity too great to establish trends to follow up on a, with a focused library design? Yeah. Um... The resource intensity to making random molecules that more than likely are not going to be bioactive um, precludes just making those random libraries. So like I said, we screen 3 million compounds and for wild type gram negative activity, which is really what we want, we had a hit rate of 0.004% or 0.004%. No one is going to allow you the time and the resources um, to make libraries around a desired property space in which that is your hit rate, um, because you'd have to make hundreds of thousands of molecules to have a couple that you might be really interested in. Um, so most of the compounds that we get are um, from other medicinal chemistry programs on other targets. Most of those are not bacterial targets, um, it's more human biology. Um, and then other molecules we get by um, uh, acquiring from external vendors and uh, you know the libraries that they make. Okay, thanks. Um, and one question is, um, has Merck published uh, the data indicating non-utility of selection based on physical chemical properties of, can of candidates? Um, have we published on that? We may have something in the works. I'm not sure if it's come out yet, but the computational chemist who put together that uh, list of bioactives um, has presented on it before. Um, her name is Li Zhao, and uh, she, I believe she was preparing a, a publication. Um, I, I do not recall whether it has come out or not. Okay. So I have another question about cytotoxicity. So how good is the, the yeast counter screen to predict toxicity? And do you use actives in this counter screen? Um, so it's an initial read. It's not an assay that um, that we always use. Um, a lot of times we'll do mammalian cytotoxicity. Um, just it, it just happens to be um, at that time when we ran that screen, we had a yeast screen running, so it was easy to throw that in as the counter screen. Um, we generally don't throw out molecules unless they are, say, 10 to 100 fold more cytotoxic than they are in a bacterial. That's not a good starting point to be at. If you're desperate, maybe you work on that. But you know, our, our end goal is to develop an antibiotic. And if you're starting with something that's way more cytotoxic than it is antibacterial, that's that's not a good starting point. Um, we will let things through and and work on things um, if we believe that we can increase the window between antibacterial activity and cytotoxicity. And a lot of that goes towards um, identifying the target. So if you uh, find the target and you find that it's specific to bacteria, that it doesn't exist in yeast mammalian cells, um, then you have confidence that you should be able to build in selectivity and then we'll work on those molecules and, and try to um, uh, build in the selectivity and get rid of that cytotoxicity. Mm, maybe a follow-up question to that is, do you use any cell line 
typical cell line for cytotoxicity for counter screening in addition to yeast? Uh, yeah, so um, we use HeLa cells um, and we use an assay called Clicket EDU, which is a readout on cell viability and also um, uh, radio label, not radio labeled, uh, fluorescently labeled um, DNA incorporation. So we, it's kind of two reads on cytotox, it's just gross toxicity to cell viability and then uh, DNA incorporation uh, or DNA synthesis. Um, so, but there's no real rhyme or reason to using HeLa cells. I've used, you know, 293T cells in the past, and it, it it really, you know, you can just choose a cell line that um, that you might have in the lab. Um, in the end, uh, anything that goes for development is going to be put through a whole battery of other tests, so it's really just an initial read on cytotoxicity. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, one question here about, yeah, what do you think about fragment-based screening? for antibacterial drug discovery for riboswitch? Um, so we have deprioritized the riboswitch um, because of the extremely high resistance frequency. Um, and so we aren't using it for that. Um, Fragment-based approaches in general are going to suffer from the issues um, that I spoke about in my first slide about the genomics era, um, all the screens run in the early 2000s um, because they're, they have to be target-based approaches, right? Fragment-based screening has to happen on the target of interest. Um, so it's gonna be an in vitro biochemical, biophysical assay. Um, and then you're gonna hope to build up your fragment to something bigger with better inhibition. And then in the end, you're gonna end up with, let's say a nanomolar inhibitor of your favorite target and it won't have cellular activity. And so I, I feel like it's, it's a great tool, um, but it's likely going to end up the same way that all of the um, uh, target-based screens ended up in the early 2000s. And, um, you know, the failures of those have been published by um, AstraZeneca and by GSK. Um, you know, GSK had the famous um, pain paper that uh, 70 targets, uh, 70 screens, and in the end, they ended up with nothing because it was all in vitro. And so we prefer um, approaches that are done in a cellular context. Now, if you can do a fragment-based screen in a cellular context, which is not easy, but possible, um, I feel like that would have a higher chance of success. Okay, thanks. Um, another round, another one around natural products this time. So yeah, you've presented this screening on synthetic libraries, uh, which is convenient as you know the structure already. But how would you screen a library of natural products? So we've actually done that. So the ribo switch, along with a whole bunch of other pathway-based approaches, was actually screened against a natural product library. Um, your uh, the hit rate from those tends to be a little higher um, because presumably they've been selected over evolution and they are privileged molecules and they've survived, you know, eons for, you know, because they do something. Um, but we were not actually successful in identifying natural products that inhibited um, any of the gram negative pathways that we were after. Um, we did find inhibitors towards the gram positive pathways. Um, and those are um, uh, being worked on. Um, but I mean, I have a, a soft spot in my heart for natural products. It's, it's where I came from. Um, and like I said, I think the hit rate is a little better, but it's no less challenging than working with synthetics. Um, yeah. Okay, another question here is about resistance, yeah. So you use resistant to study the mode of action, but do you also use this mutation to check the speed of resistance emergence and the fitness cost associated associated with resistance? Absolutely. So um, when a molecule has a resistance rate of, you know, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7, it's, um, it's just a little bit too high. Um, if it's a 10 to the minus eight, we tend to um, consider it 
and hope that by improving potency um, and maybe building in a few more interactions in the target, maybe avoiding some of the mutation hotspots, that we can get that resistance rate down further to the 10 and minus 9 or 10, which is really where you need to be for an antibiotic to have any sort of life um, when brought to the, to the market and used in the clinic. Um, rates lower than that will tend to give you um, emergence of resistance pretty quickly. Um, and there is a famous case of, uh, a I'm not going to call them out, but of a company bringing a molecule forward that had a resistance rate in 10 to the minus 7 range, and it actually led to the development of resistance within their clinical trial in patients. Um, so the patient started off with a susceptible infection, they were treated, and when checked later, um, not only did it not uh, eliminate the infection, but the, um, the surviving organism became resistant to the compound and it was target-based resistance. Okay, <clears throat> so going back to physchem properties, um, among the hits for antibacterial actives, I guess we are speaking more specifically about the ground negatives there, how many uh, have a negative charge? Uh, that is uh, a small number. So it is it is infrequent that something with a with a, a negative charge um, will be bioactive, um, and that's because presumably it's harder for something that's negatively charged to get through the two membranes. Um, however, they do occur. Um, and we've actually had some very potent molecules with free acids, um, free carboxylic acids, um, uh, you know, emerge from our screens. Um, and they and they have specific targets. So um, it, it can happen, but I would say uh, it is true that they are probably less um, prevalent than those with positive charge. Now, the issue with positive charge is a lot of those tend to be membrane disrupting. So we have a lot of molecules that come out of the screen where they have a free amine on one end, um, you know, they have whatever chemical matter on the other end, but it's mostly hydrophobic, and then those just end up being nonspecific membrane disruptors. And so that is something you have to really be careful of. So you could end up chasing down something that you think is really great only to find out that it's just nonspecific membrane disruption, and then you're going to end up with hemolysis or cell tox, and there's no way to develop it further. Okay, so another one here is about, um, so what's the average turnaround time for screening hit and uh, for screening hit identification to target the convolution using uh, either the pathway or the target-centric centric approaches you've presented? And mm -hmm. what percentage of hit compound can be categorized using your target deconvolution essays? Um, so I would say a typical screen um, to to run uh, with uh, now there's some work that has to go into that right you need to have I mean it's a lot of compounds so you have to have everything plated you have to have the assay validated but for, I'd say from initiation of the screen to a data package is uh, can be done in about six to eight weeks and then when you have that it's a, probably another six to eight weeks for all of the confirmation assays, because you don't want to just take the, the hits right out of the primary screen. You have to, you have to validate them, make sure that they repeat, that they're, you know, there's a dose response. Um, and then if the compounds are potent enough, we can go directly to mutant selection. And if that's successful, then you could have your target in hand, um, you know, within a couple weeks of, of the final hit package from the screen. Um, if that's unsuccessful and you have to run some of these other assays, um, you know, you tack on time. So like the macromolecular labeling assay, if it's done in-house, can be done in a day. Uh, we tend to, to ship it out, so it takes a bit longer to um, get the results back, but, you know, maybe three weeks. Um, if you have a particular targeted interest, so like, for instance, that gyrase assay, um, you can test your molecules in a day, right? It, it all depends on what you have up and running and what's developed, um, but it's not a long time. Um, so you you can go from from screen to target in you know three months is, is you know not unreasonable, and sometimes faster if you're lucky. 
Okay, so um, another question, which is maybe more general or physiolo physio uh, uh, physiological, yeah. Um, what what makes what qualities of a target make it good for inhibition and screening? Um, so for screening, it's anything that can um, where there's a very specific phenotype. So for instance, um, the riboflavin pathway was really good because you could suppress the bioactivity by adding exogenous riboflavin. And that's a very specific reversal of bioactivity. And so, like I said, we we sent it out for whole, we, we sent the resistant mutants out for whole genome sequencing, but we went ahead and we started sequencing all of the proteins in the pathway because they're like this, it has to be inhibiting one of these one of these proteins. Um, and it was, it was just doing it indirectly through the riboswitch. So we ended up having to um, we weren't looking for a, an RNA binding. A molecule that was inhibiting the virus, so I should end up being that, but it was in the pathway, right? So that's that's what makes those sorts of um, targets better than others is that there's a very specific readout that you're not going to get a lot of like um, confounding other pathway uh, involvement. We ran a, uh, I can give you an example. We ran a screen where we thought we had a very, very specific readout, um, and it had to do with um, cell division. And when we got the molecules back, um, it turned out that there were a lot of nonspecific molecules that were giving positive hits in that assay. And they fell into two categories. One was protein synthesis inhibitors, which had nothing to do with cell division, presumably, or you know, was tangentially related, and metal chelators. And so by the time we threw out everything that was a metal chelator and everything that was a protein synthesis inhibitor, we didn't really end up with anything in the end. Um, and that was unfortunate. So you really need to know the biology. You really need to have very, you know, a, a, a high specificity in order to make it a good target. The other thing, and this is more philosophical from my point of view, what makes a good target? I like things that are processive and need high fidelity. And so a lot of those targets are involved in DNA synthesis, protein synthesis, cell wall synthesis, um, you know, uh, beta barrel assembly and insertion. These are highly processive, high fidelity, such that you don't have to inhibit them 100%. It's enough to kind of tweak them. It's enough to throw a wrench into the machine to cause some sort of stress response that ends up killing the cell. So, you know, gyrase, those um, fluoroquinolones in vitro, they have a, a, an IC50 on the enzyme that's actually higher than the MIC. And the reason is, is because you don't have to inhibit gyrase 100% for the fluoroquinolones to work. You only have to inhibit gyrase to, you know, a certain percentage of the time to create those double-stranded breaks. And it's those double-stranded breaks that then end up leading to cell death. So those are the types of targets that I like. Something that's biochemical can be done. There are inhibitors against them. I mean, you have trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole for, you know, Fole and um, and uh, the other um, and FOLP. But um, the issue with that is that you may end up having to inhibit the biochemical reaction almost 100% in order to see cell death, um, and that's harder to do, I think. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. About the um, the very low hit rate you mentioned, so the 0.004%, um, mm -hmm. you think that the 3 million compound that we are screened were actually not designed for antibacterial activity, but more for GPCR or kinases or these type of targets, and that's part of the problem there? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely part of the issue is that you know, this is the corporate library and it is dictated by the historic programs that were run at Merck. So it is chock full of inhibitors for, you know, DPP-4, which is, you know, citagliptin, which was one of the more recent programs that was run at Merck. It's now a fantastic drug, Genuvia, but it's for diabetes. It has nothing to do with um, antibacterial activity, but we have tens of thousands of molecules probably in our library that hit that target. 
um, and those are what are screened. And so what we're looking, I mean, betimostat that came out, right? That's a metallo, uh, matrix metallopartease inhibitor. Uh, turns out it's also an RACP inhibitor, but it was in our library not because it was an antibacterial, but because it had um, other activity that, that the company was interested in at some point. Um, and so that that is part of the problem. But if you're going to go out and say, I'm going to synthesize molecules that are going to fit into the gram-negative antibacterial property space, I hope that through this seminar I was able to show you that you may think you know what that property space is, but you might be wrong. And so when you're looking at papers that describe the property space based on existing antibiotics, is that really all the molecules that fit that criteria, or is it just a subset? Is it skewed because they, you know, there's 40 fluoroquinolones in that subset, and so everything's going to look like it needs to be zwitter ionic and small, and and you know have a low C log p. Um, are you going to be skewed by having aminoglycosides, which are going to drive your C log p like way down, right? It's going to be negative five or something, right? So, if you're skewed by those that have made it, you may not be able, you may not find those that could make it. And like I said, a lot of times the property space is dictated not by the antibacterial activity, but by the developability. So, if it's only approved antibiotics, well, they got approved because they had to, um, they had to have good uh, PK, good solubility, uh, low off-target effects, um, but those might not be the only compounds that have antibacterial activity. Yeah, thanks. Um, another question about, yeah, physical properties again. Um, <laughs> Well, and the, um, so you mentioned yet yeah, also the screening against sensitized gram negatives to to increase your hit rate basically. So actually, how many? What's the proportion of these screening hit series that you can restore this poor penetration or accumulation properties uh, via medicinal chemistry programs? So it's um, it's very hit or miss. Um, I think there have been more failures than successes, but um, the example I gave in, in the seminar of that one class, so the initial hit was against um, a sensitized gram negative. It had no wild type activity whatsoever. And we probably went through a few hundred compounds um, trying to build in that wild type activity and were not successful. And then we had a breakthrough. And it was probably around compound, you know, in the 300s where we had that breakthrough and we got that wild type active. And from there, it opened up a whole new realm of, of chemistry. And like I said, it wasn't the direction we thought we were gonna go, right? You would think, okay, we gotta keep this small. Let's add an amine. Let's bring down the C log D. Like, but that's not what gave us the wild type activity. It was increasing the C log D. Um, and it was actually a mistake. We were um, designing, uh, uh, libraries, and it was actually a high throughput experimentation uh, ex, um, uh, chemistry in which you can actually create a small library using one particular chemical reaction. And there was a um, substituent that was added that we weren't thinking of making, and it was that molecule that's, that had the first hint of wild type activity, and then we went off from there. So a lot of this can be serendipitous, and, uh, and oftentimes it is. It's, it's not what you think it is. It's, you know, you got to make the molecules and test them. Yeah, thanks. That's very clear. Um, so, so we are coming close to an end of this Q and A session. So, please send your remaining questions now. Um, I have one more question here in the list. Um, again, about the target this time. Do you think that these ribose switches have any future as antibacterial targets? And are ribosyl-like projects being progressed further at Merck? Yeah, so um, as I said before, we've deprioritized that. Um, for the gram positive space, I think they have absolutely no future. And the reason is because of the fact that there is that high affinity transporter um, that is very difficult to inhibit with a riboswitch inhibitor. Not only that, but you don't have very high turnover of that protein. So that even if you um, inhibit the synthesis of that transporter, you still have plenty of transporter in the membrane already taking up riboflavin. And 
in the slide that I showed you, 10% serum was more than enough to give growth in the presence of riboflavin for staph aureus. And so in the body with 100% serum, uh, there's no way you're going to outcompete the riboflavin that's in your blood. For gram negatives, the issue was the resistance frequency. So we actually made a mutant in which we completely deleted the riboswitch. It just, we just got rid of it entirely. It wasn't a point mutation, the entire riboswitch is gone and the cells survive, they are virulent, um, and of course the compounds have no effect on them. So any sort of target in which any number of inactivating mutations, and it, I'm pretty sure you know you can go down the line of, in that entire riboswitch of 100 and whatever, 50 odd nucleotides. If you can mutate any one of them and get resistance, or you can just delete entire sections of the riboswitch, that's not a good target. The resistance frequency is just too high. You're gonna end up with resistance um, treating in the clinic. Okay, so thanks very much. I think we have now, we are running out of questions, so we, we can come to an end of our Q&A session. I would like to thank again everybody in the audience for contributing to this, this discussion with their questions. And of course, I would like to thank again Carl for an outstanding presentation, his time and sharing his expertise. Um, goodbye, everybody. And I'm ending over to you, Astrid. Okay, thank you, Ben. I would also like to thank Carl for contributing to this webinar series. And in fact, Carl was kind enough to agree to join us for a second Q&A session on the 4th of June. Um, on this, in this session, we will replay the pres today's presentation and then Carl will join us um, live for another Q&A session. This will mainly serve people who didn't have the time today in general or who cannot join at this time of the day because they are in a very different time zone. Um, I would also like to take the opportunity now to announce our new webinars coming up in June and July. On the 11th of June, we will have William Weiss from the University of North Texas on the line to talk about in vivo models for infectious disease research. And on the 9th of July, we will have Françoise van Baumbeke from the Catholic University Louvain, who will talk about intracellular models. You can register for all these webinars already on Revive. Um, um, revive.gardp.org slash webinars. And with this, I would like to thank uh, everybody for joining today and for contributing to this discussion. I really hope this webinar was interesting and useful for you and that you will join us again for our future webinars. I would very much appreciate to receive your feedback in the survey, which will pop up right after the webinar closes or per email. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. <laughs>